الناس ما بترحمش وكأن اللي حصل ما حصل وكأن الثورة دي ماتش واللي هيكسب يبقى بطل الناس ما بترحمش وكأن اللي حصل ما حصل وكأن الثورة دي ماتش واللي هيكسب يبقى بطل ولا فاكرين اللي ماتوا وهم بيحلموا بالتغيير ولا طايقين اللي عاشوا وكملوا مشوار التحرير شافوا الدور Thank you very much, Hashem. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you everyone for coming. Let me start by giving you an idea of what I would like to to uh, to share today. Uh, as Hashem mentioned, it's uh, part of uh, ideas which I'm trying to develop to to uh, write a book on uh, a question which seems to me uh, relevant. Uh, basically the question of how can we understand uh, political behavior preferences of Egyptian liberals the question uh, became once again relevant in the aftermath of uh, July 3rd 2013 where the majority of liberal civil society actors as well as political parties and politicians uh, decided to side with the military establishment in uh, taking over power, in basically freezing political dynamics, freezing uh, pluralist dynamics which were emerging in 2011 and 2012. I'm not suggesting that the pluralist dynamics we had between 2011 and 2013 were in any manner uh, unproblematic. They were problematic, but they were uh, signs uh, of uh, truly pluralist contestation which was unfolding in the country. So one of the main reasons for me to go back and decide to revisit the question of Egyptian liberals, their political behavior and preferences, and of course their relationship to the state and state ruling elites uh, has been their behavior since 2013. Uh, the decision to side with the military establishment, the decision to accept wide-scale human rights abuses and violations which followed July 3, 2013, including um, the mass killing uh, of uh, around 1,000 Egyptians, a bit less, um, as the security forces disbanded uh, pro uh, deposed President Morsi uh, sit-ins in Rabah and Nahda, uh, two squares in Cairo, which came to be uh, famous uh, in, in media reporting as well. Um, liberal civil society activists, uh, politicians, political party leaders, in fact, have supported uh, as well as the candidacy of the former defense minister, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, to the presidential elections 2014, and pushed forward uh, notions and ideas uh, which not only uh, are undemocratically spirited, but which even to an extent are quite surprising when they come from Egyptian liberals. Uh, notions of um, uh, a hero in uniform, a milita military savior, uh, national salvation by means of um, uh, pushing out of public space uh, not only citizens, but organized uh, interest representation, uh, all the way from professional associations and trade unions to uh, political parties. So there are different reasons. What I'm trying to share to start my talk is that there are different reasons to go back and revisit uh, the liberal uh, spectrum in Egypt to try to understand why they have been um, uh, pushing forward undemocratic choices, uh, undemocratic um, uh, preferences in the last uh, two years. Now let me let me take you back and start by taking you back to to highlight some of the issues uh, which are to my mind uh, quite important to understand where Egyptian liberals uh, come from. Number one. It's indeed very difficult in Egypt to define what we truly mean when we refer to the liberal spectrum. It's a highly confused uh, space, confused in the sense of 
it's difficult to outline the differences between liberals and non-liberals. If we mean liberals uh, in a European sense, it will become very difficult to outline the differences between liberals and leftists. Um, and the differences are in relation to state uh, perception, the perceptions of the social order, the perceptions of politics, the perception of citizens and the role in politics or in public uh, public affairs in general. So it's, it's historically as well as when when we look at the contemporary situation, it's difficult to differentiate between liberals and leftists in Egypt. You tend to 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 see uh, most of them grouped somewhere, uh, not far away from the ruling establishment, not critical of um, uh, autocratic uh, uh, regimes, uh, autocratic rulers. Secondly. It's very difficult and puzzling to define Egyptian liberals if we use any Western-based benchmarking. Um, it's a different tradition, which has been emerging in Egypt since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the first time the word as such, the concept as such was used, goes back to uh, public debates in Egypt between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second World War in the 1920s, 30s, and, and 40s. Uh, we had some intellectuals, public figures, some of them ran uh, in parliamentary elections as well. Uh, some of you will associate uh, liberalism in Egypt with the name of Ahmad Lutfi Sayyid, a well-known intellectual who ran for office, for parliamentary office uh, in the uh, liberal phase between the end of the First World War and 1952 the first coup uh, in Egypt. But if you use Western benchmarking to, to, to approach Egyptian liberals, uh, you will not find most of what we find in the US and in European countries. You will not find them operating based on a conception of the state which is small or uh, retreating. Uh, it's not a rule of law state uh, which does not interfere in the economy. It's in fact a maximalist understanding of the state which is called upon once and again to interfere even by liberals, not only by, uh, by leftists. It's um, uh, a state which um, uh, in fact is not only developmental but it's a state which has an enlightened and modernizing uh, role as well in most uh, views put forward by, by liberals. So if you use Western benchmarking, the question becomes very legitimate, why should we call them liberal in the first place? Do they deserve a description, uh, liberal in the first place? Uh, thirdly, a third confusion which you get when you approach the question of Egyptian liberals is how to differentiate between liberals and secular uh, politicians, public figures, and intellectuals in Egypt. Because if, for, 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 of course, for historical reasons, which uh, we can discuss as well, um, one of the clearest um, uh, intellectual and programmatic statements which um, uh, generations of uh, nominally Egyptian liberals have been making is in relation to religion and politics an attempt to push forward a separation between religion and politics. That has been sustained since the 1920s and they did not wither away from it. They did not um, uh, compromise on it in, 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 in the 1950s and 1960s or later in the 1970s. So maybe one of the clearest programmatic and intellectual statements coming from Egyptian liberals is a statement on the need to separate between religion and politics. So the question becomes, why not call them seculars, secular intellectuals and politicians and groups and so on and so forth? Are they liberal or are they um, uh, secular? And if you, if you use the description secular, some of the questions which I will be raising in my presentation on their political preferences and political behavior, uh, will become less of, of a problematic issue to explain because secular uh, groups uh, do not have to have a democratic uh, platform, do not have to have a conception of a retreating state or a small state or a rule, rule of law uh, state, uh, do not have to, to call for empowering civil society. What they are out to get is a separation between religion and politics, which a military establishment can well do. And then, of course, you can inject how Egyptian... Uh, quote-unquote liberals have been reading regional experiences. Turkey is a great important case and other cases as well. So these are three initial questions which one has to struggle with when looking at, uh, uh, at the liberal spectrum in Egypt. 
how to differentiate liberal from otherwise, be it leftist or uh, different shades of uh, leftist ideas uh, <coughs> and, and, and platforms in Egypt, how to, uh, to avoid using Western benchmarking and how to, 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 to get, get to, to some clarity with regard to liberal and secular. Uh, and the way the two um, uh, terms, uh, conceptions are confused uh, in Egypt. Now, briefly, what I'm working on right now is I'm trying to, to go back to the initial discussions. And here, I, um, w which began in the 1920s and 1930s, and so I'm, uh, it's actually great to be in, uh, in Stanford because you get to find uh, whatever you are looking for. So I was I was I was able to read uh, for the first time some of the uh, less well known uh, texts which Ahmed Lutfi Sayed and people some so Egypt experts uh, among you will know the names Ahmed Lutfi Sayed Salama Musa Al Mazni and so a set of names which really dominated uh, in the 1920s and 1930s and coined uh, how the word liberal. Uh, and the description or concept liberalism was become was being used. So I'm I'm, I'm reading them and I'm rereading Hurani on uh, the liberal age and so some very interesting stuff which uh, historical statements which which help. Now my initial um, uh, response to, to, to the three uh, questions is. Well, one can differentiate um, uh, between liberal Egyptians and leftist Egyptians using not really focusing on the state uh, conception, but focusing primarily on how they approach uh, civil society. So the one real difference between liberal and leftist in Egypt is not related to the state conception by by uh, any meaningful uh, or in any meaningful way. It's primarily related to how they approach civil society. So in 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 in, in different liberal uh, statements, programmatic as well as intellectual statements, which date back to the 1920s and 1930s an attempt was made to find and to establish um, 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 uh, a second um, um, uh, a second infrastructure to promote their ideas not via um, the relation to the state and state ruling elite but primarily focusing on the civil society this is the only way to explain why Egyptian liberals since the 1920s have been doing much in fact for uh, putting forward um, according to them modern education curricula. So I was I was surprised uh, to see someone like Ahmed Lutfi Sayyid, um, uh, once again a famous name, investing in writing a great deal of his daily press writings focusing on the educational system, not tackling political uh, debates, not tackling the big debate of religion and politics, which was back then in the 1920s and 1930s, one of the key debates Egypt, uh, uh, Egypt's uh, public space uh, was having. So their focus, they, they, they had an idea of empowering civil society. And their idea of civil society was a modernist idea. It was a modernist, uh, non-religious based civil society as opposed to um, the existing uh, structures which were, according to them, religious uh, dominated. And they were not then uh, shying away back in the 1920s and 1930s from reaching out to uh, professional associations, to attempting to organize even in the working cl class. One of, one of, to my mind, um, until I uh, went back and reread some of the literature, one of the uh, uh, phenomena which I could not explain before was that the left party a liberal party, which was established post the revolution of 1919, a national independence revolution, the left party had a very strong pres presence in the working class. And so I kept wondering why a party which was established with a liberal platform would be that keen on establishing strong presence in the working class and having that presence reflected in its programmatic statements. Uh, left Party put forward ideas on the land reform prior to 1952, prior to the coup of 1952, which was later under Nasser um, uh, coming to, to implement different land reform uh, policies. So a key, a key issue to differentiate between liberal and non-liberals is to focus on civil society. Secondly, the confusion between Western benchmarking and non-Western benchmarking I believe that Egyptian liberals were not, uh, from the very beginning, 
and here they are not different from from leftist groups all shades of leftist groups they did not from 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 the modern uh, creation of the egyptian state these groups uh, the modern creation goes back to the 19th century these groups became relevant in the 20th century they were not looking at themselves as representing uh, an opposition to the state or as representing um, uh, an intelligentsia critical of the state and its ruling establishment. No. In fact, they perceived the role as becoming um, uh, state-sponsoring elites. And the idea was to replace traditional elites um, with modern, uh, forward-looking, Western-educated, uh, not shying away from raising questions on separating religion and politics, to replace traditional elites by liberal and leftist uh, elites. They did not see in their groups, parties, uh, movements, um, uh, a power center parallel to the ruling uh, establishment. No they perceived the role as in accordance with the ruling establishment. And that was an interesting dynamic which was growing since the 1920s and 1930s, where a bit of inclusion did happen. In fact, in the liberal age, uh, primarily of liberal groups, someone like Taha Hussain, uh, a well-known uh, writer, intellectual, um, uh, became uh, minister, different politicians of liberal public figures of liberal orientation became politicians, were parliamentarians. There was a bit of inclusion, which took place especially in the liberal, uh, in the liberal age. Later leftists were uh, coming to be included, in the, some of them at least in the 1950s and 1960s. But from the beginning, the perception was not the perception of having uh, an, uh, a liberal spectrum or a left spectrum critical of the state, but working in alliance with the state. And here is, here is the key component of perceiving the state as the only modernizing agent in society. They did, the liberals took civil society seriously, but they continued to put their bet on the state, which was to push forward the, the modernizing developmental um, agenda in alliance with liberal leftists and no longer in alliance with uh, religious institutions. It was a replacement of sorts which was being uh, suggested. And, and therefore, Western benchmarking does not, does not, does not help much. Also, in Western benchmarking on, 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 on liberals, uh, Egyptian, Egyptian liberals were interested in, in notions of rule of law. Um, uh, but once again, here, the development um, uh, of their ideas on how to get an uh, independent judiciary, a stable system of um, uh, rule of law, how to protect private property, how to enable uh, citizens to equal citizenship rights uh, without discrimination based on religion uh, or whatever other um, uh, conditions. These ideas, which were developing in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, were interrupted by the course 1952. And then liberals did not have, um, historically speaking, uh, similar trajectories uh, to, 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 uh, to Western liberals or liberal, liberal groups elsewhere. So to an extent, I guess if we, if, we decide, if we try to see what kind of benchmarking, what kind of benchmarks, what kind of uh, historical legacies one should look at to understand where Egyptian liberals are coming from, one should really focus on how they perceive the state, its role, and their role as state sponsoring, state promoting, ruling establishment promoting elites, and not uh, opposing uh, elites. I, I really like to use the, the German, excellent German uh, uh, concept, Staatstragend, which is it's it's more than state sponsoring. It's uh, building the fundament of fu the fun fundamentals of the state on uh, the role of these um, uh, elites. Uh, thirdly, on liberal and secular, that remains one, one of uh, the issues which I'm, uh, I'm trying to, uh, as of now, to once again reread. Um, uh, notions on separation are between religion and politics uh, have always been central to uh, Egyptian liberals since the 1920s. Of course, uh, different variations were put forward, uh, adapting to the wider socioeconomic conditions, adapting to wider uh, public debates. But I find it, I find it um, uh, striking that um, uh, Egyptian liberals uh, in, throughout the last century, the 20th century, did not revisit um, uh, their um, uh, ideas on separation of religion and politics in any meaningful manner. Um, they were against confusing religion and uh, 
politics. Uh, they were very critical of the establishment of religious-based right-wing movements, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, later on, uh, different movements which were emerging. They were, um, uh, however, not critical of the state-sponsored, regime-sponsored use of religion in politics as well. So liberals um, uh, did not, were, 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 were um, uh, not relevant politically or in public debates in most of the 1950s and 1960s, later um, under late President Sadat, um, they were um, uh, once again gaining some ground and they did not develop a critical uh, platform on Sadat's systematic use of religion as a legitimacy uh, creating uh, tool. Um, uh, Sadat used the uh, official religious establishments, uh, Islamic religious establishment uh, with its different components to generate legitimacy and liberals uh, if we look at the left party which was uh, re-established in the 1970s were different groups were, were not as critical as they used to be later on there were diff different election based alliances between liberal groups and uh, Islamist or religious right wing uh, groups between the left and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, all the way to 2011 and 2012 so, so here too on, on the issue of taking separation of religion and politics uh, seriously. Um, uh, some discussion is warranted to understand where um, uh, Egyptian liberals stand and how, how, how they um, uh, have come to criticize uh, religious-based groups but not to be as critical of the state use or regime-sponsored use uh, of religion in, uh, in politics. So having these ideas in mind, now let me, let me take you to that's really what I'm working on right now, trying to qualify uh, the debates and understand the genealogy of different key concepts, uh, be it in relation to state conceptions, civil society, citizens, and so on and so forth. Now let me let me take you to today's uh, situation and, and, and share uh, some of the reflections I have on liberal, contemporary liberal discourses and what I call the undemocratic deceptions. Once again, it's very easy to say well, if they were not democratic in the first place, why do we expect them not to, uh, to side with the military? If they were not uh, for uh, retreating small state, why do we expect them to, uh, to act otherwise uh, post-2013? And if they were not um, uh, able to develop uh, systematic ideas on, independent, um, uh, on the independent judiciary and rule of law, uh, one should not be surprised looking at their uh, current political behavior and preferences. However, I, 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 find that I find it intriguing to look at how Egyptian liberals and the reference is to primarily politicians, uh, organizing political parties, some of them are older, some of them are new, and all the new the reference, uh, the timeline is to pre or post-2011, so you have a left party which was back in action since the second half of the 1970s, or uh, a party like the Free um, uh, Egyptians Party established post-2011. Uh, the reference is to public figures, uh, primarily uh, who use media, the media landscape to communicate uh, their ideas to wider uh, segments of the Egyptian population. And the reference is to civil society organizations um, uh, as well. Some, some of them are human rights organizations and some, uh, some are interested in uh, charity work. But this is the spectrum which we are looking at, university professors, intellectuals, uh, once again, communicating primarily to the wider uh, population using media, the press, televised media, uh, and so on and so forth. I find, that, I find it intriguing the way they have been uh, legitimizing uh, siding with the military. And, and here are the undemocratic uh, deceptions or fallacies, which I would like to outline. It's part of uh, discourse, an attempt to, 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 to do a discourse analysis of contemporary liberal uh, programmatic and intellectual uh, statements. And to get the facts right, uh, apart from a few number of liberal intellectuals who identify themselves as liberal, here I'm, I'm really using self-identification. Uh, Apart from a very limited number of liberal intellectuals, the spectrum uh, in general sided with the military uh, and ha has been in fact silent uh, with regard to human rights uh, violations and abuses. And uh, it's only very slowly that now some of the critical remarks are emerging. Uh, the five uh, 
deceptions which have been systematically used uh, to legitimize uh, turning against uh, pluralist dynamics and uh, turning against <coughs> beginning democratic uh, dynamics in 2011-2012 um, uh, are commonly used by, uh, by Egyptian liberals, but you find them uh, in leftist discourses as well, because once again, uh, most uh, leftist groups, old and new, have sided with the military establishment uh, uh, as well, which made, made, made Egypt look from, from afar as a place where uh, actors in politics or actor, actors, state actors, as well as non-state actors, uh, were driven by one, 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 one key objective, which is to get Islamists out, to get an Islamist-free uh, political arena or an Islamist-free political uh, space. But it's, it's a bit more than that. So the first deception which I'm referring to is um, the deception of um, um, the state uh, as uh, not only a modernizing uh, ag agent, but as the one actor which is able in Egypt to define what politics is all about, to set uh, an arena, to set the framework for political interactions, and to set the rules of the game. And so listening and reading what liberals have been writing in the last two years, you clearly see an attempt to say, well, it's upon the state to define how politics uh, should be uh, practiced, uh, how political interactions uh, should look like. So that idea of the state as the sole actor to define the framework, the arena of political interaction and to set the rules of the game was key in pushing forward um, uh, arguments to justify the military intervention. So if the state uh, is supposed to do it, uh, now of course the state in general cannot do it, you have to resort to the key powerful institution in the state, which is the military, and in some variations you will find the military security complex, sort of saying, well, they are uh, the two institutions or entities which can define what politics uh, uh, is all about in Egypt. And that is a clear undemocratic uh, deception because, once again, it ignores history. It ignores the history of Egypt prior and after 1952, but definitely prior to 2011. It reduces the state to the military establishment and the security uh, apparatus. It sidelines civil society and it sidelines side citizens uh, in general. So if there's only the state which can define what politics is all about and set uh, uh, the rules of the game, not in contestation with civil society actors, the question becomes relevant, so why do we have political parties in the first place, why do we have civil society organizations in the first place? What what kind of of of, of, of uh, legitimation do they have for their own parties and groups to exist if it should be left to the state? Uh, but then, when you listen, when you listen carefully. It's an idea of once again uh, creating an Islamist uh, free political arena by means of military intervention. So it's, it's a deception because it takes you in the direction of the state will figure it out and the state will sideline. In reality, it means arresting, jailing, <laughs> killing um, uh, Islamists. And getting an Islamist free political arena means a great deal of repression. And unprecedented repression uh, has been seen in Egypt in the last two years. So, um, uh, to my mind, this perception of the state as a sole actor um, uh, has been has been central to 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 liberal ideas. Secondly, the second deception or fallacy is the notion of national necessity uh, in Arabic al darura al watanay which once again, I and mean, it's not new; it has been used since the 1950s and 1960s. But not primarily by liberal groups. It's new that liberal groups are leaning heavily on ideas of national necessity to basically legitimate the military intervention in 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 in, uh, in 2013 on July 3, 2013, and to legitimate the militarization of the presidency by getting the former defense minister to run 
for for uh, for the presidential office, and in fact to to to, to legitimate as well uh, human rights abuses and violations uh, because it's a national necessity to wage a war on terror and not to to look at uh, liberties and freedoms or human rights abuses or safeguards for uh, an independent uh, judiciary and so on and so forth. So that idea of national necessity has been in Egypt, in, 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 uh, in Egyptian intellectual debates, in fact, a place where primarily leftist groups and leftist intellectuals uh, have, have worked very hard to legitimate um, uh, undemocratic developments by referring to national necessities. The necessity in the 1950s and 1960s was a bit the liberation of Palestine, the Arab-Israeli wars, or social justice. The necessities of the 1970s were later on uh, economic development. Uh, in the 1980s under Mubarak uh, up until 2011, stability, and so, so, so these are um, uh, different shades of uh, how the argument of national necessity has been used. The troubling component is the national necessity has been increasingly used in the last two years by Egyptian liberals to legitimate um, uh, freezing politics and moving beyond democratic uh, dynamics and to legitimate in fact, the supremacy, uh, the dominance of the military and security uh, apparatus, and then you tend, you tend, you tend to see it um, uh, reduced to uh, uncritical support of uh, the current president. Once again, embodying the national necessity as the savior, which is a very problematic idea, and it 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 has it has a component of uh, savior or hero in uniform. Uh, incarnating uh, national uh, necessity, uh, a highly passive perception of what the population is uh, all about, what politics is all about, so it gets reduced, the state and politics and public uh, spaces get reduced to what the savior uh, wishes to, to see or to do. And secondly, the idea of a nation in, in exceptional conditions, the idea of ex uh, exceptionalism. I'm not sure of any country which was able to democratize or push forward pluralist dynamics with that perception of exceptionalism. Exceptionalism is always a, a, a legitimation for um, uh, moving beyond <laughs> safeguards of freedoms and liberties, for evacuating citizens out of public spaces, for imp imposing one opinion uh, on, on, on citizens, and so on and so forth. And that is um, uh, the second deception. The third deception, uh, once again, look, analyzing contemporary liberal discourses is um, uh, the idea of um, uh, the readiness to democracy. Once again, uh, I guess uh, any one of you who has been working on, on Egypt or in Arab countries will, will find uh, different shades of this argument of are we ready, the question, are we ready for democracy, coming from uh, state actors, coming from state rep representatives, but as well as well as from leftist um, uh, and liberal uh, politicians and public figures. And the fallacy here is, is basically it freezes the uh, understanding of democracy as a process. So it really puts forward an idea of an idea, a panacea of sorts, an ideal place where, where we have to be there first before unleashing democratic dynamics. And it, 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 it's, it, it, it has uh, uh, many undemocratic elements, but primarily uh, once again, uh, suspending the notion of democracy as a process which, which uh, warrants exp experiments, which warrants uh, a great deal of interaction between different, uh, different groups. Uh, number four, um, uh, once again, um, a, a notion of, um, uh, of, of clear undemocratic um, uh, connotations. Um, the idea of um, uh, evoking uh, it's it's Egypt and the region. It's uh, how how the region and regional events are being used to legitimate uh, the new autocracy in Egypt and to legitimate uh, imposing um, uh, the militarization uh, of the state structures in general, the militarization of the presidential uh, office, but. In, in fact, and freezing political dynamics, understood as pluralist dynamics, how the region is being used. So the reference uh, is always to uh, the tragic cases of Iraq and Syria, and Egypt should not be Iraq and Syria, and the only way for Egypt not to be Iraq and Syria is to 
let the military do. And um, uh, once again, when it comes from state representatives, it's less uh, alarming than when it comes from actors trying to be part of um, uh, public debates and trying to be part of decision-making processes, but they use the region in a manner which is um, uh, just justifying, in a manner justifying uh, autocracy, justifying human rights abuses and violations by evoking a sense of regional risks, regional uh, tragedies, and Egypt uh, and the Egyptian state and Egyptian society being kept intact, being uh, saved saved by uh, the, military, um, uh, the military establishment. Once again, here is, is a highly selective uh, perception of what the region is all about, but even more pro problematic is that you do not find any discussion among Egyptian liberals on how despotism in Iraq and Syria led to where Iraq and Syria stand as of now. So that is basically pushed out of the discussion. It's as if Iraq and Syria, their stories began uh, with toppling down uh, the dictator in Iraq and uh, with the Syrian uh, quest, popular quest for uh, freedom in 2011. Finally, um, uh, and, 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 and here, here I come to, uh, to a set of uh, ideas related to how liberals look at citizens and their role in politics. I, as I was part of the political scene in Egypt in 2011, 2012, and 13, I, I found some statements coming from uh, nominally liberal uh, politicians, uh, party members, intellectuals, alarming. So there was a statement which was made right after uh, the first constitutional referendum in March 2011, in which basically uh, the popular vote uh, went in the Islamist direction. In the Islamist direction back then was the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafi uh, groups. I'm not going to get you into the details of what the referendum was all about, but right after um, liberal and leftist movements or secular uh, movements were defeated in the referendum of 2011, there were calls coming up from different uh, public figures saying, well, maybe we should figure out how to introduce a two-class system. Uh, in relation to voting, so how to make uh, the vote of educated Egyptians uh, more important than the vote of non-educated Egyptians. And I said, wait, I mean, it's too nonsensical for any uh, public figure to put it forward. But they were serious. They kept, and they, in fact, as of today, you will find the same argument being pushed forward once and again, every single time. And you know, Egyptians are not going uh, to... Uh, to that um, uh, uh, fake uh, uh, process which is being uh, turned elections. Uh, but as he used to go, uh, every single time they were called right after uh, election results were announced by liberals to, well, to let's figure out a way of classifying uh, the vote, uh, of not simply, uh, of disenfranchising uh, those who do not vote the way we would like them to vote. And then secondly, starting 2011 as well, there were different ideas put forward by liberals on the so-called <coughs> supra-constitutional articles. Uh, and the idea was basically to freeze politics. Um, these ideas came in circulation right after Islamists were beginning to win in every single uh, election. So the referendum 2011, parliamentary elections 2011 and 12, presidential elections 2012, Constitution referendum 2012, and so they were pushing forward ideas on let's agree on a set of supra constitutional principles which cannot be changed, not by parliaments, not by elected parliaments, nor by elected uh, presidents. When you look at the details of uh, these supra constitutional articles, they were all, in fact, going in a Turkish direction prior to the democratization uh, process in Turkey, basically getting the military establishment to be the ultimate. Uh, right. referee of, uh, of politics, uh, enabling the military to basically um, uh, systematically uh, interfere in politics every single time uh, Egyptians decide to vote, unlike what liberal and leftists are telling them uh, to do. And so these ideas 
once again we're um, uh, leading post 2013 right after the military interference in politics into uh, arguments in favor of uh, we should leave it uh, to, to, to the military establishment. Uh, it's the one establishment which, which can protect the state. And so what about citizens? And so if, if liberals decide to ignore civil society post-2013, to ignore political parties, to once again go to the state-sponsoring, state, state, sponsoring, state promoting, uh, role, uh, what happens to citizens? And, and here you see citizens being looked at by liberal intellectuals and politicians uh, in, in, in four different manners, uh, all of which are undemocratic. Number one, citizens as in deep need of uh, um, awareness, education, to be able to participate in politics. Once again, a highly static conception of what democracy and citizens uh, in democracies or in democratic transitions are all about. Uh, the idea of freeze, uh, let's uh, go back and uh, make our, make uh, awareness campaigns, educate them right, and then get them in. Disenfranchise citizens until they uh, get it right. Secondly, the idea of citizens as being, uh, now voters, uh, as being reduced by social and economic uh, incentives. So liberals, in fact, and leftists, uh, when they refer to Egyptian voters, they always refer to them in Arabic. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing a literal translation as voters, uh, sugar and oil voters. The reference is to how uh, voters, uh, according to, to liberal groups, once again, get reduced to uh, uh, voters deciding on their political behavior, on their vo voting preferences based on social and economic uh, conditions. Citizens uh, are only welcomed to uh, to participate in politics or be part of the public space, according to liberals, if they decide to carry on uh, the dehumanization of the other, and the other is the Islamist other as of now. And so if citizens say no to do dehumanization, human rights violations and abuses, um, uh, it's legitimate to imprison, it's legitimate to jail, and it's definitely legitimate to evacuate them out of the public space. Uh, and of course, when, 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 when the evacuation materializes in a very low voter turnout of the parliamentary elections, less than 5%, uh, then they get back at it and say, well, 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 why didn't you come out and vote? But well, you disenfranchise them and you ask them to, to leave. You ask them not to be part, part of the debate. Finally, they look they look at citizens as, um, in fact, not in, in any manner uh, as agents, individual agents, but they tend to group them in masses. So, once again, not surprising when it comes from uh, Nasserists in Egypt, but quite surprising when it comes from liberal groups and liberal uh, public figures. They accept uh, the creation of an imaginary collective entity uh, called the masses, and the masses get pushed around according to regime uh, preferences. So these are the five um, uh, key, to my mind, key deceptions which have been systematically used in the last two years by Egyptian liberals uh, to legitimate uh, their support of uh, the military intervention and uh, the emergence of the new autocracy. Uh, let me end on two uh, two notes. Number one, that does not mean that some uh, of, of, of the nominally liberal uh, parties, uh, liberal agents in Egypt do not every now and then uh, do not make some critical remarks on uh, the savior and his policies on the current uh, uh, administration and its policies. But when they do, it's, it's not, it's not um, uh, by any manner driven by uh, democratic uh, considerations and it's not in any manner driven by a uh, principal position. It's actually driven by the little revenues they are getting. I mean, they imagine that they will be getting more revenues uh, and they imagine that while getting a military uh, administration will enable them to be the key uh, component of politics. Uh, creating an Islamist free political arena will mean that liberal and to a lesser extent leftists will be the dominant actor, but it's not. The military is doing it independently, uh, as it has always done. 
it's once again, I mean, they have a huge misreading of what Egyptian history is even all about. But you will sometimes, when you follow Egyptian debates, you will see some struggles, but it's 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 not driven by democracy in any in any manner. Thirdly, uh, secondly, uh, that does not mean that the liberal spectrum uh, in Egypt does not have alternative voices or young generations which are trying to figure out ways of transcending that autocratic legacy of existing uh, liberal elites. Uh, there are some very interesting groups which uh, primarily operate in universities, which operate among uh, informal networks, and they are pushing forward uh, a healthy debate on uh, military-civilian relations, a very interesting debate on religion and politics, a very interesting debate on the use of religion, be it from, from state or state actors, because the current administration, in fact, uses religion increasingly, more and more, uh, as a, as a uh, source of legitimacy uh, in, 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 in different ways. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that that is uh, what we will end up having, and I, I see a great potential for development within the le liberal spectrum in Egypt. It's generational. These are young people, students, and young Egyptians working in informal networks, but they are pushing forward the right debates. It will take time to impact the wider public space. It's related to how strong the current uh, autocratic um, uh, grip uh, will remain, um, how, how, how massive human rights abuses and violations uh, are. At the end of the day, we have, uh, according to some estimates, close to 35, anywhere between 35 and 40,000 Egyptians uh, imprisoned. So uh, these are all factors relevant, but the process is emerging, and it's not only political. Uh, the very dynamic scenes, intellectual uh, scenes, cultural uh, production, literary production, and this is all coming from young Egyptians trying to revive uh, some of the ideas which uh, brought them to, to the streets in 2011. Thank you very much. اتضرب رصاصة غدر في ماتش اتقتلت بيها احلامنا ومفيش راجل فيكي يا بلد قال لا بلاش اولادنا الناس ما بترحمش ولا تترحم على اللي حصل اولادنا كانوا في ماتش والموت ليهم وصل ده الناس الناس ما بترحمش وكأن اللي حصل ما حصل وكأن الصورة دي ماتش واللي هيكسب يبقى